Recording in progress. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to Sunny's Book Club June edition, I think, is what this is for. Uh, we read Open Throat by Henry Hoke, little tiny novel uh, about a queer mountain lion. So I am going to start how I always do by reading the blurb to you um, for anyone tuning in who hasn't read it yet and just wants to hear the discussion. And then I'll open it up for some questions. If that sounds good. Uh, a queer and dangerously hungry mountain lion lives in the drought devastated land under the Hollywood sign. Lonely and fascinated by hum humanity's foibles, <laughs> foibles, the lion spends their days protecting a nearby homeless encampment. Observing hikers complain about their trauma and, in quiet moments, grappling with the complexities of their gender identity, mem memories of a vicious father, and the indignities of sentience. When a man-made fire engulfs the encampment, the lion is forced from the hills down into the city the hikers call L.A. As the lion confronts a carousel of temptations and threats, they take us on a tour that spans the cruel inequalities of Los Angeles and the toll of climate grief. But even when salvation finally seems within reach, they are forced to face down the ultimate question. Do they want to eat a person or become one? Henry Hoke's Open Throat is a marvel of storytelling, a universal journey through a wondrous and menacing world recounted by a lovable mountain lion. Feral and vulnerable, profound and playful, Open Throat is a star-making novel that brings the mythic to light. So I guess generally, how was everyone's time with this tiny book? Any anecdotes from your reading experience um, you want to talk about or how you found it? Um, did we vibe with it? Do we like our mountain lion narrator? I would answer, oh, go, actually, Lizzie, go ahead. You can go first. Okay, I'm on my phone, so it's like the, I can't tell when someone else is starting to talk. Let me see if I can change it. Okay, um, there's only four of us here. Um, I just wanted to interject and say that I listened to the audiobook, so I missed, like, the main point of, like, the syntax of this novel. Whoa, okay. Yeah. So it was a completely different experience for me, I'm sure, than it was for people who read the physical book. Yeah, what about you, Alex? How'd you find it? I would say upon just re reading it physically, I liked it. I will admit I'm kind of confused because I knew that the appeal of this or the advertising or marketing was that it was about a queer mountain lion. And I could tell like just through evidence maybe why that is but I don't know if it went over my head maybe um about exactly what that was trying to entail but I know queer is very like encompassing so it could mean a lot of different things which I'm sure we'll talk about but yeah I was a bit uh blindsided by that a little bit uh not that I mind I think I don't think that really affected my reading uh with what I expected but I liked it overall about the themes and the messaging and symbols and mm -hmm. things like that I think the word queer was like a little bit clickbaity in the description. Um, what I, I I thought about it and what I, because it wasn't coming obviously to me either. What I think is that um, the mountain lion didn't really have like a set gender because the girl then gives him a, like a, like calls it she and the mountain lion just goes along with it and like didn't doesn't like ever correct it or like say that that's not correct so I think I just repeated myself I think that that's why he was supposed to be queer I think yeah Karen any initial thoughts you want to share um before we dive into questions I liked it it was definitely like very nothing I've ever read before could compare to it <laughs> like it was very unique um I listened to I think it was hosted by Barnes and Noble but I listened to like an interview with the author and I didn't know anything about him but I thought that was interesting because it shed a little light on why he wrote it and like how it connected to his personal experience um so I would recommend listening to that I tried to like read a couple interviews too and I think that was like helpful and understanding the book a little bit better for me mm -hmm. yeah you know, I, oh, is, go the, ahead. is the author uh, identify as queer so maybe that word in the like the second word in the description of the book is like kind of a way to like more normalize it and like 
if if it's a book about like a straight character you don't have to say that but like it's just kind of like oh by the way I don't know if I'm articulating um kind of like it would go unsaid if it was a straight character but since it isn't since since I don't know I don't know never mind scratch that no I feel like I know I know what you're getting at there like so much of this book is about the blurring of lines I think between like reality and this like hyper state of imagination like we'll get to the Disneyland passage later but so much of this book was again about the blurring of like two binary things like nature and man and discovery and identity so I think that is where the queerness of it all came for me is this character kind of seeking community and identity and only having like two choices to pick from like is he wild or is he civilized is does he have a family or is he alone like everything was very like having a menu to choose from and he's just kind of exploring where he fits in with all of that of all of these like preconceived structures and binaries that he's like trying to find himself within in in community um I really liked this book I haven't read a book from start to finish in so long so that felt so nice of just being able to like sit down with a book for like an hour and a half and get through it um and I think it's very literary like even the blurbs on the back are just such big heavy hitter like big thinkers that I think it's very zeitgeisty in a way. And I think um, that hyping marketing machine behind this book in particular is working on a particular audience and that audience is me. So I think that's funny that, you know, fallen victim, fallen victim to the traps that are being set for me. Um, But obviously I think like one of the most unique things about this book is the narration being from an animal. I can't think of other books that I've read where I've enjoyed that being done, um, except for this one in a really long time, other than like childhood favorites, you know what I mean? So in the themes of like queerness and gender identity being explored, how did that all work for you guys through the lens of an animal and not a person? I think it blurred the lines even more between human versus animal because it could have been written by a human. Like a lot of the thoughts that the mountain lion produced um, reminded me of like neurodivergence. Mm-hmm. And it, a lot of the quotes that I wrote down, which I didn't, I was like driving and listening to it. So I looked up the quotes in Goodreads later and just like wrote down some of my favorites. And it's very like, 2012 Twitter like kind of trying to be weird but also trying to be deep (laughs) that's very like neurodivergent human characteristic and just like you said like completely blurred the lines of nature versus nurture Mm -hmm. I think for me too is just like another level of absurdity that like these questions would even be plaguing an animal you know what I mean like they're so obviously human constructs of like what gender even is and that performance of gender that it was just like sad and funny at the same time that these would be plaguing like an animal um so I think it had like a level of removal that was able to kind of dissect that a little bit and poke at it that I felt really worked for me um and I liked I think the idea that it was a mountain lion like a predator animal Mm. also gives us sorry also also gives us the idea that you know um that like humans like a lot of times we don't think of ourselves as predators but we really are like the worst of the predators. And I think that that, that ha- choosing that specific animal to narrate the story, I'm sorry. Do you get, I'm sorry, let me stop this. Bad poodle. Troublemaker. <laughs> uh, trying to like, like we're dangerous and we don't know it. Kind of like the narrator. 
um what's his name like Hackett I don't know just a named narrator that later is called Hackett Mm -hmm. how okay so I think like outside of identity and this weirdness that we're thrown into into an animal narrator's mind the other big thematic thing that's happening in this book for me is the concept of like language and communication itself and how language and the lack of is still used to convey like meaning and emotion in this book are there any specific passages that stood out to you guys in that regard or any notes you have about the use of language in this and I guess how it transferred to a non-speaking narrator yeah, actually, this is probably my favorite thing about the book that made me the most curious, and that's how easy it is for Hecate to use profanity. So as we grew up as people, we know that profanity is a very socially constructed thing. Like we just, it doesn't really make sense. It just sounds like a random word when you say a cuss word out loud, but it's something so obvious that we give negative meaning, which I feel like in, in a way, this book is actually very negative. I know we were talking about how easy it is to feel between this lion feeling human versus understanding their own non-humanness but it's interesting because Hecate knows they're powerful they know how high upon like the animal system whatever that they are as a mountain lion that they are a predator uh, like Lizzie was saying and then one quote I really liked is I feel more like a person than ever before because I'm starting to hate myself so it's so weird how learned it is of the mountain lion watching these people and especially the use of cuss words, how it's so easy to understand what that means, probably because it heard it from these humans all these years, uh, but how it never questions it. It never wonders what a cuss word is. It just takes it for what it is and uses it all the time, uh, assigning it as like a very negative emotion. Mm -hmm. Also, not having the language for certain words, like money, for example, kind of puts into perspective how much importance we place on green paper which to the lion is just a piece of green paper but to us means like everything mm -hmm. like that's another technique of like othering that I feel like he's using in this book is just showing these commonplace things that we take for granted or so ingrained in like part of our day-to-day -day and just showing the queerness of them and how strange it is that we're placing importance on like certain things in our society and I think using the animal narrator in that sense like really works for me to be able to again just add that level of absurdity to this book but I think like it's not always funny at all I think this book is pretty violent and sad and talks about displacement in an interesting way and also kind of lived trauma um maybe we start with the themes of displacement in this book I think there's you know obviously the lion thinking back to his his jungle days and kind of his the place that he came from and um, reminiscing about the fact that he's displaced from there but it's also interesting that he's next to the houseless camp and is making community with other displaced creatures as well. Um, and they kind of have a symbiotic relationship formed between them and get different things from each other. How did that work for you all? I mean, I'm sure most of us live in like urban environments and that's part of your day-to-day -day life is, you know, being in community with houseless people. How did that feel again, I guess, from an animal's perspective or just any general thoughts about that positioning of that topic. I think I um, at least Oh, sorry. Uh, Lizzie, I know you can't see us maybe, but you can go ahead. Uh, I can see you, so that's fine. I'll know when you're done, so you can go no, first. No, I saw that you stopped muting as soon as I did. Go ahead, go first, please. Okay, um, I was just going to say, between the like the homeless element of the story and then that fire that happens, it like I guess the sense of why that happened didn't initially uh, make me think too much beyond just knowing that it was L.A. and the LA unfortunately has a very high homeless population. 
Uh, and then between earlier in the book, how we're easily introduced to these people that are well off, like phone calls about should they see XYZ therapist or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought of it in that way. But then I think of, I guess, literal places in the book too, where things happen that aren't exactly homes, like those two men at that cave or something. Yeah. So even between things that maybe are more uh, promising or positive, like what those two men were doing in a cave that's not a house, but trying to like socially construct what is a home and what is not. Uh, I guess to an animal, it makes sense everywhere is a home, um, except the city, maybe, because uh, if they sort of do just revert back to the wilderness, they could technically live out everywhere. But we as people, we have to have really uh, constructed places to sustain ourselves and live. Uh, even with the encampment too, even how these homeless people kind of made it their own. Uh, and then unfortunately that fire happens, whether or not that's like a theme of reverting back to nature or something like that. Um, but yeah, initially I didn't think much about that section when that happened, but uh, it's sort of something I've like dwelled on as I've finished the book uh, since a while ago. Mm-hmm. So I guess I don't ha- really have a comment about like the setting of of that but I do have something to offer about um like animal like animals in comparison to houseless people as like inferior um especially like living in Portland and knowing like the war that is going on right now on like sweeping the camps and like um not like there's just so many like people fighting against each other like within our government right now like trying to figure out like where where like the tents can be set up and it's just like these are people these are like human beings but like in the same sense like the animals are like living too and like who are we to say that we're like more important than the animals that lived there before we did Mm -hmm. yeah like the hierarchy approach of what's important and who we protect as natural resources get consumed and like displacement is happening to everyone I thought was really interesting in this book um and it didn't seem like from a lens of I guess like pity from um our mountain lion it was just like something that was happening and I think was able to show I guess the the inequality that's just you know going to flatten everything at one point which I think is interesting from obviously a very human centric world and you know our our inclination to protect natural resources is really for our expense not for anything else's and I think it was I mean this whole story is about kind of like p22 that famous mountain lion who lived in the hills and was like a local celebrity and I do think it's interesting that people were like devastated when he died and you know, really did so much to protect his habitat in the hills and try to make his life, I guess, enjoyable and safe. And then, you know, there's, again, humans in the same park as him who none of that consideration and care is going towards either. So it is kind of an interesting discourse around how much we don't prize and then prize animals at the same time. You know what I mean? Like, if we can put attachment and like I can never say this word anthropomorphize anthropomorphize you know that one uh if if we can like place that and humanize them then we care about them um but it's just like an interesting kind of divide going on again this whole book is like tensions for me of of those two conflating ideas which I think was really fun to read um I didn't like I didn't I never realized that it was connected to the actual mountain lion in Griffith Park um I didn't know that that one died did like do you know how was it like the same way that it happened in the novel I think it was natural causes um oh okay. I didn't do that much research on p22 but I remember when that happened and I think that's what happened okay so he wasn't it wasn't killed by humans you don't think I don't think so um okay. if you think it's I think I think he got sick and then I think they like put him down but I think he had health issues okay like that's funny we even know that you know what I mean like it's funny it's funny we even know the mountain lion had health issues 
Yeah. It's a major news story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we've placed like so much importance on like what we think, like we decide, like humans decide, Mm -hmm. like, for example, like whales versus sharks when like, why? Because like sharks bite people sometimes like whales eat way more things in the ocean, but like, just because I don't know. It's just something that always bothers me. It gives me very much Harambe vibes. <laughs> Rest in peace, Harambe. <laughs> we'll never forget you. Um, and then we have kind of like a major turning point in this book, right? We're in our thicket. We're being observers of the funny LA elite and also nestled into other walks of life. We're learning what humans are like. We're observing their daily habits. We're lonely. We're thinking about our past. And then we meet, what does he call her? How do I not remember? Little Slater or something? Yeah, Little Slaughter. Slaughter. We, we escape into the city and we find Little Slaughter. Do you guys have any, how, how is this turning point for you? This is like the surrealism kicking in into this book for me, you know, like we're not alone in the lion's thoughts anymore and interacting with a human was, I think, pretty jarring for me, but also fun. Um, how did you guys feel about the relationship that was formed between the lion and Little Slaughter? Okay, my first time that I listened to it, I listened to it twice because like the first time it was very jarring for me and I much preferred the first half of the book where it was just him living in the wilderness, not the wilderness, but like along, I like I was, I kept picturing like Runyon Canyon, yeah. but um, like hearing like these insufferable yet endearing humans like over overhearing their conversations with each other um transitioning into living with living in the like little pit area of the house um was very like like just jolting and so I listened to it again and like started to really enjoy like that different setting and different relation where he was actually interacting um the disney part though however i like don't want i want someone else to talk about the disney part me too so we're out of luck (laughs) i'm just kidding um yeah i think like again the context shift for me in these different like physical and emotional spaces that our lion is going through is another exploration of the idea of home and belonging um I how do you feel like his mental space was when he was in a physical home do you think he like found a sense of home or companionship with little slaughter um it's just an interesting I guess trajectory from his solitude and like longing for companionship and partnership to have found it and do you think he's happier when he finds it I feel like it's kind of hard because uh, if I remember correctly, I feel like with Little Slaughter, uh, of what we like know about her a little bit, she's at least the first representation of maybe femininity, if we were to just call it that. Because otherwise, this book is very like violent, masculine, uh, and like very hyper masculine stuff. So I think maybe it could be where the lines just uh, associating peace with femininity so things are more calm just being with her it just so happens that it's based also indoors so it's like those binaries you're talking about CJ in the beginning like it's very it feels very much like a decision making thing reading this book about okay do I like it when life is more masculine or feminine in this case or is it more layered than that where I'm also indoors and outdoors and that represents like domesticity or whatever so that's how I read it as little slaughter just being this symbol of femininity maybe Mm -hmm. even though she's just literally seen as like at least probably a woman to the lion or something of what it knows of it because otherwise it's always been like these very graphic details like the man with the whip uh which always seemed a little like 
uh, pseudo-sexual or psychosexual to me, uh, a whip symbol maybe, I don't know, but we do know we meet him later. Um, but yeah, things like his throbbing neck, I don't know, just like these words the line was using. It's like, this sounds a little, a little risque, a little PG-13, but with Slaughter, it was much more like tame, quote unquote happy maybe, the dreamings of Disneyland, just this imagined life where maybe it yearns more for that side of its life that it wish it could try to repre like represent. Um, I know at some point with Slaughter, the lion early in the book, it talks about seeing its reflection. I think this is at least on page 20, but the lion says like, oh, I didn't know what that word was yet. So it's kind of weird. The book jumps around, like it knows what's gonna happen. It knows the future. So I think it's Slaughter that teaches it the word reflection uh, and like what that means and how to really see itself and who it wants to be, whether masculine or feminine, if we were to try to give it those binaries too. Yeah, I think it's interesting too that even the mountain lion is regendered in this contextual space of home, right? Like he can't even exist in a masculine frame in this new context because it's so abnormal to him. Um, Lizzie, you brought that up earlier. And I think that's like a really interesting, tr another transformation that happens that again, is just about binaries. Um, yeah, that was interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Another thing that's happening is like little Slaughter is hiding in her dad's basement from the new wife and baby, like also displaced in her own home, trying to make a home and like regender and reparent and mother something, which I think is like an added layer of these different physical and emotional spaces combining um and just this need for escapism from a home i think is is interesting when we think about the wild and the domesticated again hmm and now we're at um disney i think in the book Lizzie, you said you don't understand Disney. I don't really understand Disney either, but I think that's okay. I think like after I, I reread it a couple times too. And I was like, okay. So at first I was more concerned with trying to understand if it happened. And then I was like, okay, I don't think that matters. So how, how did it feel to me anyway? Um, and I guess my answer to that is really fun like this was my favorite part of the book because it was the most confusing and out of reach for me I think and it just like catapulted us into a kind of psychedelic psychological space of extremities you know what I mean of fantasy and of the artifice of a place like Disney World and like the kind of elemental physical and emotional spaces it's trying to produce for its consumers and the people who are going to Disney of like happiness and belonging and community and fun and joy and you know like all of the positive emotions that you can experience is what Disney is trying to convey through every kind of contrived space that they build for you um And I just liked it a lot. And I think that's all I have to say about Disney. What about you guys? <laughs> I only managed to maybe soak it in. It honestly confused me too. I wasn't really even sure what was real or what wasn't. But maybe in the lion's head, it could be where it knows LA is like this artificial thing based on the conversations of those people that are like, who do I see as a therapist, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it's confusing to where the lion's like, why would you all have LA, which you all built? And then, which is itself a fantasy. And then you go to another fantasy like Disney, uh, like none of it's real. Why go to another place to try to escape the inevitable of your life, blah, blah, blah. So uh, in a way the book, I think in itself does a really good job at executing like the futility of life, I guess, uh, without it being like heavy handed or whatever, even though the premise is so simple, because I'm sure, you know, if you, there are teachers out there in the world, like in high school or something that are like, write a short story from the animal perspective. And I'm sure a lot of people have wrote a story like this, where it's just like, oh, I, these people are, people are weird. Uh, the world is bad. And that's pretty much what can sum up this book in its own way. Uh, but I think the way Henry Hoke uh, takes care of it, I think is so interesting. Like this mix of like so many different things going on. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe I was 
caught by the clickbait too, the queer mountain lane. But I feel like as more we've talked about it, these binaries and stuff, it's a, it makes me like feel a lot more rewarded having read the book uh, with what we talked about so far. Mm -hmm. I like what you both said about it, especially about the idea of like LA already being like this type of fantasy world. And then there's Disney. There's like not even anything remotely close to Disney for animal, like from an animal's perspective, like, because that I think that's why it like makes no sense. And it just kind of a, was approached as like type of fever dream, but like also like a very activated, anxious attachment style in that point. Yeah. Yeah, the more we talk about it, I'm like, wow, every choice in here was really considered, I feel like, um, and layered, which is fun. If we go to like page 130, it's the immediacy after the Disney section. And the scream that fills my ears lets me know that I'm waking up for real. So I think I also love the immediate like transference from, you know, the happiest place on earth to being on the run and found out and kind of this like adrenaline that takes us through the last part of the book um and gets us into like a little road trip narrative almost <laughs> of, of escapism which I think like again is another maybe very American trope of of what it looks like to flee and like the partnership found in in fleeing from something, um, which I think is interesting. Yeah, how did this very last section of the book work for you guys? Like the daughter kind of renouncing her her family and and her and the cat kind of making a run for it. I feel like overall, like he went from like the Disney section, they were in that like happy bliss of domestic. He was, you know, she was taking care of him and feeding him and everything. He had like no worries and then wakes up. And then when they leave, then like leading to the end, he kind of goes back to like his roots of being a wild animal and I guess maybe realizing that life of getting taken care of wasn't for him or something. Mm -hmm. I think that including the road, the road trip and like the uh, visualization of cars and like what um, the lion calls the highway, the long death, um, that it, like really represents like the most dangerous aspect of like what humans have created. Yeah, I guess yeah. there's these like elements of escapism, like when he learns to open the car door and then like they're fleeing the house, then he's fleeing the car, the, the car, and then he's fleeing the mentality of like, being domesticated at all and trying to involve himself with these human relationships I mean I think he's still considering little slaughter and like obviously spares her but he he leaves again like this this mentality that he was just inhabiting in this space to I guess be more primal or be more more in line with his true his true nature and and being able to inhabit like what that meant for him um and in this case i guess it's violence um can someone remind me of the man with the whip like he appeared previously in the book right and then obviously he's the victim of this last scene um what was he doing earlier in the book i feel like we're just introduced to him i i don't remember in between but i know at the very beginning he's like with this woman 
and I think playing with her sons or something. I don't know. It's kind of funny because we're introduced to him by him like laying on the ground. And then what did he say? Let me quote it. It was so funny because I thought it was weird. I thought this would be like a conflicting thing or like a, or a source of conflict. Something about his nuts. Uh, he's like, yeah, hit me near the nuts or something. Uh, I was like, well, that's weird. Um, no king shaming here though. Um, but yeah, and then just at the end where we know, you know, his conclusion. Uh, like you said, CJ, I think it is a matter of just, uh, I guess the line felt like it had to choose. I mean, clearly it was in a really stressful situation, so it didn't really have any options anyway. But I really like what Lizzie said. I completely forgot about this context of maybe what we could assume is the lion's uh, war spear is the long death because it recounts it so frequently. And then where it willingly goes on the road trip with Slaughter. Uh, I didn't think about that until now, about how that's like maybe an acceptance, I guess, of death or maybe something like that. Uh, and then again, accepting violence, uh, possibly again, accepting masculinity, if that's the binary discussion we're going. So, and then literally leaving slaughter, femininity, possibly X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then I also like this little note. It happens very briefly, but I think at one point the mountain lion, Hecate, as it's about to be killed, uh, it tries to act like a little cat again, like it tries to be small. Um, so it still like yearns for, I guess maybe at least what I thought is like it deep down wanted to stay how it wanted to, but society just had to choose for him, which I guess you could say is a large, uh, theme of like queerness anyway, with life, uh, and trying to live by a social construction. So, yeah. So was the man with the whip, not the one who set the fire in the encampment? He might have been. I can't remember. I only remember that's, him at the beginning and the end. That's what I was going to say. I think the man with the whip and his friend are who set the fire. So I took the ending to be like Hecate's almost like revenge on them for doing that. Mm. That would definitely make more sense. Yeah, he, he already didn't like the man with the whip from the beginning from having the whip and like the whip is a weapon and then he comes back and he's like throws the fire or sets the trash can on fire near the house houseless uh encampment and then everything all shit goes down from that and then later he sees him a third time mm -hmm. and that's when he, like loses all his domesticity and goes back to like his mountain lion nature man that's that line i retract my claws and try to become the kitten at the center of myself right before he gets killed is really sad <laughs> um just kind of like the unlearning of the performance that you've had to put on to go back to something maybe softer or like m more authentic. Like, I, I like that that's questioning again, like, is the violence the authenticity that he was running from? Or is it like a, another like nesting doll inside where it's, you know, something smaller that didn't need to act like that in the first place? Um because all of that was learned, you know what I mean? Or was it for animals? I don't know. Like that's, I think that's so, so interesting. Um, and maybe what it's calling to question too, of like the abusive mountain lion father at the beginning and kind of how he had to show up to be able to survive him and like flee from him and get away from him and all of that. Yeah, that's so funny. I, I forgot about the abusive mountain lion father and like it's another thing that we don't think of in relation to animals we don't think of like animals as having parents like that and that's just like a very human construct especially in big cats right like it's all I mean I think you do hear about the mothers staying with the cubs and like you know the the pr the pride I don't know I'm pulling my Lion King knowledge out the pride of the family and like the fathers going off to hunt and stuff but I think they are kind of like matriarchal like clans of animals so it's interesting that like that was repeated to or like whatever we think a matriarchy is I don't know this is this book is crazy the more I think about it I'm like wow this is really like push and pulling on our assumptions of every binary that we like assess in in both nature and in humans and humans are nature again you're getting yeah. Henry Hoke <laughs> that makes me want to research like 
lion behavior with like the father and the like when the kid grows up like do they fight each other like I want to research that and like find out if that is something that happens Damn, this was a good book. Thank you guys for the conversation. Is there anything else we didn't cover that you think we want to talk through? I just have one other quote that I thought was meaningful. And it's, if you feel alone in the world, find someone to worship you. And that really makes me think of like a human's social media presence. And then like taking it one step further humans making their animals have a social media account because like the animals do not care yeah okay no other closing thoughts I think uh, the only I'm just curious why everyone thinks but I honestly couldn't wonder well, my first thought is that I'm sure PETA hates this book, but the second one is, why do you guys think, what is Hecate? Like, I, I really couldn't try to, like, think of the etymology of that. I don't know. I, I could think of other stuff, like LA is LA, but I don't know, Hecate. Uh, is that just like a thing, like names aren't real? Like, if you say a name long enough, it's just not a real word. I, I don't know. So I don't know what you guys thought about Hecate. That's a great point. I had that on my list to Google, but I never got around to it. So I'm definitely going to after this call, but I like your interpretation of just like a gibberish word. Like what if it was like Henry, Henry, Henry Hoke, heck it. Like, I, I wonder if that's like a, another playing with, with words that he did of, of like a self-insert there. I would like that, but we'll see after this call. <laughs> I thought Hecate was the name of a witch from a different book, but I might be completely wrong. Yeah, it probably is some Macbeth shit. You know what I mean? Like, it's it probably is like a literary insert. Um, that wouldn't surprise me at all. But I was wondering that. Even slaughter. I'm like, what is that? Like, you know, very intentional choice of words in this book, which I think is fun. Cool. All right. Well, thank you again, guys. Have a good Saturday. Thanks for joining. Um, love you so much. Bye.